Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this new series of lectures on Christian faith and uh, modern uh, art. I'm not going to talk about modern art as a whole. I have a very specific focus, and the uh, focus is, given the very radical and rapid changes of style over the last hundred years, how did those Christians and sometimes Jewish artists who wanted to be true to traditional Christian or Jewish iconography manage to express their vision of this at the same time as retaining their artistic integrity. And a fundamental challenge has faced all of them. This challenge runs all through these six uh, lectures. Because there has been a breakdown of what the art critic Fuller, Peter Fuller called the symbolic order. At one time, uh, there was a shared narrative, a shared set of visual images in our society. So whether people are disbelieved, they knew what was being talking about. That, of course, has all fragmented. And it fragmented fairly early. David Jones, whom I will be dealing with in some detail in the third lecture, uh, called it uh, The Gap. Uh, and he was referring to the fact that all his artists in the 1920s and 30s were aware they faced a fundamental uh, challenge. Because on the one hand, how did you avoid simply d doing pastiche, repetition of the, the stale religious art of the past, which had gone dead on people? And on the other hand, if your uh, own style was so personal, idiosyncratic, how could you communicate to a wider audience? So there's been a fundamental challenge, and that is what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with uh, it, uh, it with modern art, so you might very well say, when does, when, when's modern? When is modern modern? Well, I'm taking it from modernism, which most scholars would suggest emerged shortly before the First World War, the music of Stravinsky and the novels of James Joyce, a bit later, poetry of Ezra Pound and, and, and T.S. Eliot. Uh, and uh, in art, I associate this with uh, German uh, expressionism, and that is where uh, I am uh, beginning. Um, this is uh, Nolde, uh, uh, Christ uh, with uh, children. Expressionism is characterized by intense emotion revealed in distorted features and figures, uh, very in intense, sometimes lurid uh, colouring. This again is Nolde, who came from a very, very religious uh, background. This is, of course, uh, the Last Supper. And this is Pentecost. The American theologian uh, Paul Tillich suggested that there was a particular affinity between expressionist art and the Christian faith because he pointed out quite rightly uh, a truly, a, 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 an entirely realistic art, naturalism, uh, cannot convey the transcendent. And on the other hand, uh, Christianity uh, needs to uh, communicate the word made flesh, images, and therefore abstract art by itself is not usually enough. And he suggested that uh, most Christian art that works would have some expressive uh, element in it. And that's the last one of, uh, of Nolde, the crucifixion. Now, this, we now come on to Beckman, 1884 to 1950, who, who rejected uh, the term expressionism, in fact, and what it signified, and wanted to be part of what he called a new objectivity. Uh, he very much admired the nor northern European artists like Bosch, Bruegel, and Grunewald. Um, he was very much influenced by World War I, and one of the features of so much of the art that I'll be considering in the next six years has been deeply affected uh, by the wars and the suffering of the 20th century. This is called The Descent of the Cross, 
Uh, it is a very stark and disturbing uh, picture. Uh, but his next one is perhaps even more so. This is called Night, uh, which obviously in some sense reflects the imagery of the crucifixion, but in very much uh, modern terms. And Beckman said, in my paintings, I accuse God of his errors. My religion is hubris against God, defiance of God, and anger that he created us such that we cannot love one another. At the same time, he was a very spiritual man like Kandinsky and Mondrian at the time. Uh, he saw himself as a fundamentally spiritual artist, and he said his, his effort, his work was an attempt to move from the illusions of life towards the essential realities that lie uh, hidden beyond it. And then the last of the German expressionists that I want to consider is, is Otto Dix, 1891 to 1969. This is called Echi, Echo Homo II, uh, painted uh, immediately after World War uh, II. Uh, and as you will see here, uh, Christ is identified with a, a prisoner of war uh, and is barbed with a, uh, the crown of thorns uh, is made of barbed wire. Again, an identification between the suffering of Christ and the suffering of the 20th century, one of the recurring themes. This is another one of Otto Dix called Christ and Veronica, actually painted in 1943. Uh, and you'll see there that instead of Roman soldiers, there are uh, thugs. Just to remind you of that legend, when Christ was on the way uh, to the cross, uh, he met Veronica in the street who wiped his brow uh, with her handkerchief. And according to legend, the imprint of Christ's face was left upon her handkerchief. And there you see... Uh, uh, the, the handkerchief, another uh, uh, one of Beckman's with the handkerchief there just over the cross. Now I'm going to spend uh, rather more time on Jacob Epstein, 1880 to 1959. Uh, this is a, a self-portrait. Epstein was born in New York in 1880 at a time when it was uh, packed with refugees from all around the world. He early developed a facility for drawing, and when his parents left the city, he stayed behind, rented a room, and made a studio, and went out into the streets to draw some of the fascinating people he saw there from all around the world. He soon developed a strong conviction that he should be a sculptor, and that he had to go to Europe, both to see great works from the past and meet modern sculptors of quality. He studied in Paris, and in 1905 came to London, eventually taking out British citizenship. This is called Maternity, which he carved in 1908. At the age of 27, he was commissioned to carve some statues on the front of the new BMA headquarters in London. And the result was some very strong primal images of both birth and maternity, which deeply shocked people at, it at the time. And this indicates one of the defining features uh, of Epstein's life, the sense of outrage that his carvings aroused. For example, the BMA building eventually came into the hands of the then southern, southern Rhodesia when on ad inadequate grounds of safety uh, the carvings were almost totally obliterated. <laughs> However, his work continued to develop and this uh, resulted in some many superb carvings in flenite and, ma and, and marble. Uh, but, uh, sorry, there, uh, there is a close-up of his maternity but much more controversial uh, than that was rock drill. Um, this was one of the kind of defining works of art of the early part of the uh, 20th uh, century. Uh, this uh, made him uh, l to be brought about the fact that he was labelled as part of the vorticist movement, and actually recently there's been an exhibition of vorticist art both at the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice and here in London, where they had to, as it were, reconstruct uh, Epstein's rock drill. But when we come on to the main sort of focus of what we're on about, we come to uh, the Risen Christ, uh, which is in Edinburgh. 
Called up in World War I, Epstein had something of a breakdown, but out of his sense of horror at the war, there emerged this, the risen Christ. Epstein was Jewish and had a Jewish upbringing, a point I'll be considering a little later. So how was it that his first major work with a religious theme should have such a distinctly Christian uh, connotation? In his uh, autobiography, he tells how in New York, as well as drawing and read, uh, drawing, he read prodigiously, and specifically mentions two books, Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, which is, of course, the most profound and searching of all novels which explore the issues of belief and non-belief from a Christian point of view, and the New Testament. And the face of this work, of The Risen Christ, was based on a friend and great supporter of his, Bernard Van Deren, who lay very ill. And Deren's ha head from Epstein had a mystical quality, and he made a mask of it. He said the mask was filled with suffering, but it was so noble and had such high quality of intellectual life. I thought of him as the suffering Christ. And one of the features of this work is the way that Christ points to the wound in his hand. And this was an expression of Epstein's revulsion at the carnage of uh, the war. Uh, later he wrote, I must maintain that my statue of Christ still stands for what I intended it to be. It stands and accuses the world for its grossness, inhumanity, cruelty and uh, beastliness. And later on, he remained pleased with this. Later on, much later on, he said, he, he recognised how in this work I realised the dignity of man, his feebleness, his strength, his humility, and the wrath and pity of the Son of Man. This is a, a, a bust, um, and uh, he was a brilliant carver of, of heads and heads and shoulders, and indeed, uh, because of course his other work was so controversial and nobody would buy it, he actually had to make a living by uh, doing these busts. This is of uh, Kathleen Gorman. Epstein's personal life was, as they say, irregular. He, in fact, kept uh, two, maintained two totally separate homes. Uh, but uh, having lived with Kathleen Gorman as one of them for 30 years, he then eventually married her and she became uh, Lady uh, Epstein. Uh, and it's on Kathleen Gorman that he based... Uh, the Visitation, which is ostensibly about the, pre about the uh, Elizabeth visiting Mary, but is in fact uh, modelled on, Ka on Kathleen uh, Gar uh, Garman, uh, pregnant with her first child. And he wrote that the figure for him expresses a humility so profound as to behold shame the beholder who comes to my sculpture expecting rhetoric or splendour or genesis. A few years later, he produced Genesis, a much more elemental and universal expression of motherhood. And then there is Day and Night, which you will see today uh, above St. James's Park tube station. It was originally the headquarters of the London Underground uh, Electric uh, Railway. As you will have noticed from these statues, uh, carvings and his early ones, Epstein was much influenced by the carving of the early cultures, African, Oceanic, and Aztec, as indeed were many sculptors uh, at that time. And Epstein actually had one of the best collections in the country uh, of those uh, sculptures. Once again, there was a huge furore uh, over his work, which resulted uh, in the fact uh, that despite architects wanting him and his work for their buildings, uh, he, in fact, had no public, public, major public commission for 10 to 20 years. And this series of rejections may, in fact, have led him to carve his monolithic Behold the Man, which again could not find a buyer for many years, uh, but, as some of you will know, now stands in the ruins of the bombed Coventry uh, Cathedral. The huge howls of outrage at Behold the Man um, and the mirror even refused to show a photo of the statue, gaining plaudits for its readers for the decision. But Epstein noted that, actually, my religious statues have had strong support from the clergy. So any clergy here will perhaps be encouraged uh, by that. That statue also had very, very strong support from uh, the art critic uh, Anthony, Anthony Blunt, uh, who at the same time wrote very, very... Uh, perceptively about the challenge that I 
mentioned at the beginning, for all artists in the 20th century who wanted to depict uh, religious uh, themes. Um, so um, he draw, Epstein uh, draws uh, inspiration, uh, as I say, from the statues and the carvings of earlier cult, sculpt, uh, periods. This is called uh, consuma Consumatum uh, Est, um, carved in 1936. Um, words which some people will know, uh, translated into English means, it is finished, uh, and they are the last words of Jesus according to St. John's Gospel. Now, this brings out another fundamental point about his work. It was the stone, the shape and the material of the stone which dictated the direction he took. He would see a vast block of Subiaco marble as he did with Behold the Man and a long piece of, of, of alabaster as he did with Consumatum Est and keep it in his studio for a long time looking at it until he saw various shapes in it. And it was this, even more than the figurative image, that he sought to bring out with his carving. And he conceived the final form of this particular work after he'd been listening to Bach's B minor Mass. And he wrote, I see the figure complete as a whole. I see immediately the upturned hands with the wounds in the feet, stark, crude with the stigmata. I even imagine the setting for the final figure, finished figure, dim, uh, crypt, uh, with a subdued light on the semi-transparent uh, Alice Pastor. The art critic Richard uh, Cork, uh, in his book on Epstein, uh, admired the book, um, but he thought that the, the title didn't in fact uh, match the sense of strength uh, in, in the body, because Cork takes it that the phrase, it is finished, means sort of something uh, de de defeated, uh, and there is huge strength in that. But I think Cork misunderstands what St. John's Gospel is about. Uh, because in St. John's Gospel, uh, Jesus is not simply buffeted by events. He is, as it were, striding the world in control of events, doing the Father's will. And the words, it is finished, consummatum is, indicate that he has succeeded uh, in fulfilling the Father's will. So I think the, 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 the vibrancy and the strength of this figure, as it were, the figure almost wanting to get out, does reflect that very strong Jesus of St. John's uh, Gospel. Uh, this is uh, Adam, uh, paint, uh, carved in 1938 uh, 9. Um, people were puzzled that Epstein, a Jew, should depict so many major Christian themes. So, at th this point, let me say something about his religion. First of all, his Judaism. He was brought up in a very Jewish quarter of New York, uh, a bit of Polish Jewry simply transplanted there and his father was a leading member and benefactor of the synagogue. Uh, in his household there were daily prayers, Bible readings and Hebrew lessons. On the Sabbath, the young Jacob had to spend most of the day in the synagogue and he duly went through his bar mitzvah. He found all this stifling and distanced himself from it as soon as he could. However, it gave him a deep knowledge and love of the Bible and a sense of the sheer power of the biblical stories, as, for example, we see uh, in such sculptures as this, this, uh, this, this one of Adam, uh, and also in this one of Jacob wrestling uh, with the angel. But whilst he was in New York, he was taken up by people in a, in a settlement there, and that settlement in New York was no doubt like similar settlements in England at that time. Uh, usually motivated and financed by uh, people from universities, very often, more often than not, people with a Christian inspiration. And Epstein found that this wider world of the settlement liberated him from the stifling confines of the Jewish ghetto and in introduced him not only to Christians who were an influence on him, but Yiddish intellectuals who had similarly thrown off uh, their religion. This stands in the foyer of New College, Oxford. Um, uh, it is, uh, sorry, that's, that, sorry, that of course is a, just a close-up of the we, one we've seen before, um, of Jacob wrestling with the angel. And then we come to uh, Lazarus uh, in the foyer of the chapel of New College, Oxford. 
and a close-up of the head. Austin Farrow, wonderful Anglican theologian, uh, preached on this once, and the sermon contains the line, this happy region of death from which he drags his eyes so unwillingly. What is it? This is Christ in Majesty, carved in 1954-5 for uh, Clandaff uh, Cathedral. After World War II, there was a new confidence in commissioning uh, Christian art. Coventry Cathedral was the major expression of this, but this carving of Christ in Majesty at Clandaff was another one. Coventry Cathedral uh, was almost totally destroyed by bombing in 1940 and uh, in the early 1950s Basil Spence was commissioned as the architect for the building of a new cathedral. He invited Graham Sutherland, John Piper and Elizabeth Frink to do work for it. He also wanted Epstein and in 1954 he took the Bishop of Coventry, Bishop Gorton, to look at the Madonna and Child and there's the Madonna and Child which you'll recognise in Cavendish Square. The bishop stood up, looking at it, oblivious of the traffic, and said simply, I, Ep, I, Epstein's the man for us. Later, when Epstein's name was brought up before the committee responsible for commissioning the cathedral, Basil Spence noted there was a shocked silence, a length broken by the remark, but he's a Jew, to which I replied quietly, so was Jesus Christ. <laughs> So, as a result of the uh, Bishop of Coventry immediately recognising in Epstein just the sculpt he wanted for the uh, cathedral, uh, he commissioned, uh, that, sorry, that's a close-up of the one in, in uh, Cavendish Square. Uh, he, he commissioned this St Michael and the uh, Angel for the front of Coventry Cathedral. At the uh, meeting where this was discussed with Epstein, he was asked about his faith, to which he responded by saying it could be seen in his work. And in a radio broadcast, he enlarged on this in the words, my tendency has always been religious. It may not be known, but that is a fact. Most great sculpture is occasioned by faith. Even the African sculpture, which we don't understand, is full of their faith. So Epstein was an innately religious person, whose upbringing on the Hebrew scriptures had gone deep, even though he'd given up his Judaism in any formal sense. The other fact, in addition to the friendly encouragement uh, of a lady called Mrs. Moore and others at the settlement in New York, was his lifelong friendship with some Christian intellectuals and clergy. He and T.S. Eliot became friends, and Eliot was amongst a small group invited to Epstein's 70th birthday party, and the one who lit the candles uh, on the cake. Uh, when Epstein died, Eliot wrote to his widow to say, it is as if some of my world has crumbled away. Uh, we loved him. Epstein was buried at Putney Vale Cemetery with Dr. Hewlett Johnson, the Red Demon of Canterbury, taking the service. And a memorial service was held at St. Paul's Cathedral, at which his friend Canon Mortlock said, if we ask how it was that a boy born and bred in the Jewish faith and never embracing any other should become the interpreter of the sublime mysteries of our religion. There can be no clear answer. Such things belong to the inscrutable wisdom of God. Now, if we place Epstein uh, anywhere, you know, if we, we, if we have to go in for labelling, it seems to me clear that he, he is in some sense an expressionist, uh, as indeed uh, is the next person we will be considering uh, today, the last person I'll be considering today, uh, and that is George Ruo, 1871 to 1958. This is the photo, photo of the artist at work, um, which he also called the Workman's Apprentice. Um, uh, that's the Workman's Apprentice, that's a self-portrait, um, and that's him. Uh, he, you'll see 
uh, that he's wear, shown working clothes, rather like a baker. Um, and he, he, he always said uh, that he'd, he, because such was his respect for good workmanship, uh, he'd rather be a good artisan than a sloppy artist. Uh, he, 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 his father uh, was, was, ga was, was galled, was, was upset, even by the sound of a door squeaking, uh, as if wood itself were being made to suffer. So perhaps this is one of the sources of Rouault's extreme sensitivity to human suffering. This is called In the Old District of Long Suffering. Because a clear influence on him was the poverty uh, of the people ar around him in the poor part of Paris where uh, he was born and brought up. And he never lost his profound sympathy for those burdened by life. And in this respect, he's like Rembrandt, another deeply Christian uh, artist. This is called Take Refuge in Your Heart, Vagabond of Misfortune. And this is called Lonely in This Life of Pitfalls and Malice. Guo once said, the art, the art I aspire to will be the most profound the most complete, the most moving expression of what man feels when he finds himself face to face with himself and with humanity. Art should be a disinterested, passionate confession, the translation of the inner life, as it used to be in the old days in the hands of our admirable anonymous Frenchman who sculpted the figures on the cathedrals. At 14, he was apprenticed to a stained glass maker, and the influence of this early training can be clearly seen in all his uh, work, with its heavy black lines and blocks of colour. In the evenings, however, he took art classes and then studied at the École des Beaux-Arts under Gustave Moreau, Matisse being a fellow student, uh, and where Rouault won a prestigious prize. Moreau encouraged the individual talent of each student and indeed with this in mind actually encouraged Rua to leave the college though he continued to give him private lessons afterwards. Moreau's death in 1898 sent Rua into a major crisis and that too is reflected in uh, his paintings. Uh, now he painted with what was described as an offensive lyricism. His subjects being prostitutes and marginal people of the streets he could paint nudes of great beauty in a way that showed the influence of Savannah, but it was the depiction of prostitutes that he showed his distinctive life and view, view, style and view of life. Unlike other artists of the time, he showed them as neither romantic nor erotic, but as human sufferers, abused and knocked about by the life they led. As he put it, behind the eyes of the most hostile, ungrateful or impure being dwells Jesus. Also from this period of his life are his portraits of clowns and other circus performers. There was a moment of revelation in 1908 when he wrote to a friend about what he'd just seen. The wagon of nomads halted in the middle of the road, the tottery old horse grazing the spare glass, the old clown in a corner of his wagon mending his shiny and no longer motley costume. The sharp contrast between the shiny glistening things that are meant to amuse and this exceedingly sad life, at least when I observed it from afar, later on, later on I clearly realised that the clown was myself. He was all of us, almost all of us. Because in contrast to other artists of the time who, who wanted to depict the gaiety of such scenes, he saw the sadness behind it. We put on a mask for others, but inside our life often feels very different. Behind our glittering masks, he said, we all hide a tormented soul, a tragedy. And the mask and the makeup cannot hide the wrinkles and the sadness of the gaze. And here, as in other paintings, it is the face which is always so powerful. The intensity of feeling in a face is usually uh, highlighted by some kind of contrast with the, uh, the clothing. 
uh, in pictures of clowns, for example, uh, the clothing can be bright, even garish. But we're caught by the haunting individuality and isolation of the, of the face. As he wrote, I saw clearly that the clown was myself. It was all of us, or almost all of us. The rich spangled garment is given to us all to wear, and we're all clowns to a certain extent. We all wear spangled garments. But if someone glimpses us unaware, as I glimpse the old clown, oh, who can truthfully claim not to be moved to the very depths of his soul by enormous pity? My fault, if it is a fault, at any rate it causes me untold suffering, is never to leave anyone their spangled garb, be he king or emperor. It is the soul of the person standing in front of me that I want to see, and the greater the person, the more extolled he is as a human being, the more I fear for the good of his soul. Who wears no disguise? Uh, or uh, Who wears no makeup? was a title he used for a number of his paintings. Now another major theme from 1907 to 1914 uh, was that of judges in the courtroom. But here again his stance is distinctive. He didn't paint them simply to condemn the oppressive system any more than his paintings of prostitutes were designed to be so purely social comment, comment. What struck him was the anguish of human beings having to judge other human beings. So a judge's features could sometimes be identifi identical with those of the defendant. As he put it, all the riches of the world could not make me take on the position of judge. And what he felt about judges is not dissimilar to what he felt about those who had to rule, as in this very well-known painting of the old king, a king who clearly looks burdened by his crown, the weight of the ruling. Now there were many, of course, who criticised his paintings and deplored his switch from an earlier, more pietistic style. As Léon Blois put it, if you were really a devout man, you'd not paint such horrible canvases. But that's to misunderstand the effect which religion and perhaps has and perhaps ought to have on people. As Rouault put it, I don't believe in vague and tremendous theories or ideas about the other world, since in practice they're lifeless and not viable. I abhor such wanderings of thought and action. They can only culminate in a soggy and facile idealism, which in its arrogant attempt to explain and sort everything out, ends up blunting the edges and wearing the fabric until it becomes threadbare. Holding such bland softening in horror, I much prefer cynicism and even the most grotesque or violent forms of realism. Very unusual statement coming from a devout uh, believer, uh, but it uh, received very strong support from Father Jacques Maritain, uh, who was a friend of Jacob Epstein, and as we'll see in later lectures, a great friend of Eric Gill and David Jones, a very seminal figure for artists uh, working uh, with Christian iconography uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century. For Rouault, uh, there was no such thing as a separate religious art. Uh, there is just art, and that is enough to fill one's uh, lifetime. This is called, This Will Be the Last Time, Little Father. Rouault did paint some pictures with more joie de vivre in them, as well as landscapes and still lifes, but it is the darker theme that we particularly associate with him, no doubt significantly due to his personal sensitivity to human suffering, uh, but few would deny that it was a temperament that expressed one escapable aspect of life, not least in the cruel 20th century. Rouault did a series of woodcuts from 1917 to 27 called Misery, from the refrain, Lord have mercy on us, on the misery of war, which were finally published in 1948. And this is uh, one of those woodcuts. This will be the last time, little father, obviously making his last confession uh, with death looking over his shoulder. This one is called My Sweet Country, Where Are You? And he also did a painting with the words of Plotus uh, on, on it, uh, Homo homini lupus, uh, man is wolf to man. And he did uh, this one, which he gave uh, the title, We Are Insane, which is clearly indicating some of the people he thought were responsible for the war. 
Now, when we turn to his more sharply focused uh, Christian imagery, this is the head of Christ, 1937. From about 1914 onwards, religious themes became a very important part of his work. Uh, but as has been noted, the characters depicted in the view of life behind them did not fundamentally change. The bowed figure of Christ reflects the bowed figures of his paintings of burdened humanity generally. Christ condemned to death reimages the criminal and the corpse he saw being condemned to death. And this is a fundamental to his whole understanding of what it meant to be a Christian uh, artist. As he said about his painting called The Injured Crown, uh, Clown, in my view it is quite as religious as, composition, uh, as compositions with a biblical theme. This is Christ with onlookers. Christ mocked by soldiers. The flagellation. Eternally flagellated. Jesus will be in agony until the end of the world. He gave one of his pictures a quotation from the French philosopher Pascal, Christ suffers until the end of the world. But despite this emphasis upon the darkness of life and the suffering of people around him, uh, he did hold a Christian vision of life, not a totally tragic one. This is called, At Times the Road is Beautiful. You get that sense, don't you, with the sunrise coming up and the light shining on the people there. This is called... It would be sweet to love. This is called Sing Matins, A New Day is Born. And this is called, He that believe in me, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. This is called the Holy Countenance, or more technically the Mandilion. As I mentioned earlier on, when we looked at that painting of Otto, uh, behind this is the story of the image of Christ on Veronica's cloth, which was a central image of Christian art in the West for more than a thousand years. And it reminds us that Christ is present and brings strength to us when we are in the depths. You can see the mandillion there over the person who's either ill or dying.
the dark is a fundamental theme, but Christ is there, as it were, imaged through the Mandelian. That's called De Profundis, out of the depths of I called unto thee, O Lord, from the psalm, which of course was also the title that Oscar Wilde gave his famous writing from Reading Prison. And this is one of Ruhr's many crucifixions. Painted, this one painted about 1920. The dark is once again a pretty fundamental feature. The crucifixion could almost be taking place at night. The sky is dark, the land is dark, and the outline of the cross is black. And this serves to focus the eye of the viewer on the unearthly light of Christ's body and the faces of those by the cross. That light isn't bright, is it? It's rather, it's pale, it's, it, it, it is a paleness that emphasizes the humanity and vulnerability of the flesh. And the figures either side of the cross are absorbed in the suffering in their own way. To the right, John lifts his neck and face ardently in the direction of Jesus. To the left, Mary kneels in devout prayer. And the attention, intense attention of these two helps to draw the onlooker into the picture and to make their own response. The head on one side, with the eyes half closed, looks down gently and questioningly on the onlooker. And this is not just a public painting for public art to be viewed from afar. It's a deeply felt personal response to the crucifixion, which itself seems to require or invite a personal response. And here's another one of his crucifixions. Where here, as before, we see one of his fundamental themes in many subtle variations, where the viewer is brought up so very, very close. Uh, Ruo saw his work, task, as one of obedience to his personal vision, a vision which he interpreted in profoundly Christian terms. As he put it, uh, I am obedient. Just about anybody can be a rebel. It is a much more difficult undertaking to obey silently the dictates of one's soul and to spend one's life looking for the truest means to express one's temperament and talents. And having been at the cutting edge of art at the turn of the century, he was enabled to find his own voice, and to that he sought to remain true amidst all the succeeding changes of artistic fashion. Uh, his work appeared in the prestigious Fovist uh, exhibition in 1905, Fovist the Wild Ones because of their vivid use of colour, but of course there was much more to Ruo than that. Nor did he really belong among the feverish uh, German expressionists, uh, and indeed not to the French ones, because he was the French one, if we're going to use that term, with his own, own distinctive style. Uh, many would say uh, that uh, Ruo is the most profound of the uh, artists seeking to convey Christian themes in and through uh, 20th century uh, art. Uh, 